Hello everyone, I'm Brahm Mithra. Welcome to Kingdom Death Season 2. The reason why I'm calling this Season 2, it is, it is a new campaign, but there are some things that happened in Season 1 that will continue on to Season 2. I'm going to describe mechanically, um, you know, game stuff right now, what happened. So, uh, there are things called strain milestones that occur while playing Kingdom Death. And these strain milestones add things to all future campaigns. So during season one, the last campaign, we unlocked uh, some fighting arts, which will carry over. Uh, we've also have Giggle Lion, which will be in this campaign because once you defeat the vignette, Giggle Lion is therefore in all future campaigns that have White Lion. And as White Lion is the only prologue monster right now, White Lion will also be in this campaign. But you know, we will probably fight some Giga Lions as I'm going to try to make things a little bit different from Season 1 to Season 2, mainly weapon uh, proficiency, specialization, stuff like that. So, um, and I'm going to use different expansions from Season 1 and things. But for the most part, we have um, Infernal Rhythm, which is a fighting art, Infinite Lives, which is a fighting art, and Armored Fist which is a fighting art. So these will be in the fighting art deck permanently. So the fighting art deck right now is nothing but the base game. Uh, I have not added any expansions. I'll do so in the settlement phase, but for right now, so that means the only extra fighting arts that are in here are the strains that we unlocked during season one. So if you wanna see how those fighting arts get in the game, uh, they're in season one, uh, the last episode, and mostly, you know, the later years of the Lantern years when you start getting those um, strain unlocks. Not all the time, but for the majority of the time. Uh, we also have another Vermin, which is added to the deck. So that is the uh, Fiddler Crab Spider, which will be different. So that is added permanently to the Vermin deck. So that will be in this. This is a another uh, People of the Lantern campaign, technically. Um, but it's actually a Twilight Knight and training variant of the People of the Lantern campaign. So you set it up and you start everything normal as you would People of the Lantern. People of the Lantern is the core game. So for people who didn't watch season one, or maybe you just decided to skip season one and you're just going to do season two because that's the current campaign that's running. And that's the one, you know, the season one is technically over. Uh, what I mean by technically over is there will be an episode 50 of season one. It will come out after this episode. Why I've decided to wait on episode 50 is things that happen in season one. The story, there's a story arc of a certain survivor that will carry over to this season. That, that Survivor story arc, um, I didn't want to write it. I've, wrote, I've written everything up to this point, season one, or season two starting, but I didn't want to finish it because that would, it seemed um, like I would be taking away some randomness of the prologue. So I've decided that I'll run the prologue first, see what happens, and then before the settlement uh, phase, of season two, I'll just put out episode 50. So it will cover everything that happens in between the season one and this prologue fight. And like I said, the reason why I did that is I, I couldn't make, I didn't want to make it overly ambiguous. Whereas it felt as I was writing it, it felt like there wasn't really much of a story being told. And I didn't want to make it too finalized as to make the prologue not like non determinental and carry no weight. So, I know it's weird. <laughs> it's very weird. No one would ever suggest doing that if you're writing a movie. Don't start writing the sequel and then go back and finish your other movie. That's terrible. Many movies do do that for some reason. They, the first movie feels like setting up the sequel. But anyway, I didn't want to do that. So, this, whatever happens in this fight, whatever ha maybe there won't be an episode 50. Maybe there will. <laughs> so, that is coming out still. Uh, sorry, and again, sorry for the, the, such a long delay between season one and season two. Uh, writing episode 50 was one thing, and then, you know, I, I did, there's a homebrew that I did for Kingdom Death. Hopefully it was entertaining. It's also here on, um, 
there's a video for it on the channel for that homebrew. So if you're interested in something like that, that is also what I did between season one and season two. But let's get into season two. And as I, as I was saying, if there's people who decided to watch this because, you know, 1.6 is coming out and maybe they've decided that because this season two will be running probably when 1. Point, or 1.6 gets released and all those people get their new core box and everything, they'll probably just start season two and not watch season one and then maybe go back and watch season one. So for the first couple episodes, I'm going to describe how to play Kingdom Death. So for everybody who watched season one, it, it, you know, it will slow down the first couple fights because I'm going to s explain things and Kingdom Death has a lot of rules. But at the same time, I'm not going to explain every rule. Um, I'm just going to explain how to play Kingdom Death. Uh, rules, keywords, they're not written well. And trying to explain them, I'll probably explain them wrong because certain other possible deterministic outcomes could happen where those keywords don't mean what they're supposed to mean. Or There's so many variables in this game when you introduce expansions or just different hunts and quarries have different variables played into them. So, I'm just going to start with, you know, the basics of how to play. <laughs> so, People of the Lantern, playing it again. Uh, I'm going to remove some things out of it, mainly the where the Twilight Knight comes. The, there's no the the five. I forget what it's hooded the hooded knight thing that happens when you get five innervations. There's no real reason for that to happen in this uh, campaign. So it's all People of the Lantern, with the exception of the things I just went over. The variants for the strain cards. So if you are watching this and you never played King of Death and you decided season one or episode one of a season would be the best one to try to learn, this deck is altered because of strain cards. My vermin deck is also altered from base core, but that's it. The other thing is this is variant Twilight Knight. So I will start with a Twilight Knight. So with that, everyone will start when you play King of Death. You start with a. Uh, cloth and a founding stone. That's all you start with. And the, you know, the, the thing in King of Death, the book, uh, the, the prologue event and everything, when you go through it, I'm going to be running the prologue and everything, setting up the, the deck exactly how it's supposed to be. It's actually a really good introduction of how to play. I know, you know, I've done it too. Board games, you would you felt it's easier to just watch a YouTube video of how to play than it is to actually read the books sometimes in rule books. I get that board games. I'm guilty of doing that. I'd rather watch it, watch it played, or someone else teach me how to do it. <laughs> but this is a really, that's a really good one. The one in the, the book is really good. So I do suggest you actually do read that, even if you do watch this to learn how to play, or watch someone else, because there are probably other people who can explain it better. So with that, we will have the Twilight Sword gear will be on one of the survivors. That survivor specifically will be named Lightning. She will start with the Twilight Sword. Now, with the Twilight Knight in training variant here, uh, she begins, every, just like everyone else, no, no age milestones, no anything, except for she starts with Twilight Sword Proficiency, and she starts it with a Specialist, and she starts it at third level. So, with Specialist, you can see here, all she's going to be doing is ignoring Cumbersome, since she has three levels of Twilight. And Cumbersome just means you, you have to use both your movement and your action to attack. So she's ignoring cumbersome. It's just a keyword. Um, in addition to that, she will also start with the cloth and the founding stone because again, this is just a twilight, or it's just a people of the lantern campaign, and then this is a variant to it. It's just a one variant. So uh, this isn't. Any, so if you are watching this and you do get 1.6 core, this is actually in the back of the rule book. It is a variant you can play completely with core. So. The other option is, this might come in 1.6, so if you have 1.6, you might get this. But uh, the Dormant Twilight Cloak is what she will also be starting with. And as you can see, Dorm the Dormant Twilight Cloak, it's unique, it's irreplaceable, it's an accessory. Uh, so, you know, irreplaceable just means if, if you die, you, it, it, you, this isn't replaced. Uh, however, with Twilight Note and training anyway, if, if, the if the Twilight Knight dies, the campaign's over. So the alt the variant rule for this is the Twilight Knight will the Twilight Knight in training doesn't age must always depart and if they die that's it campaign's over so those are the variants that's the thing I've set everything up here let's get started with season two showdown prologue line we have everything set up here on the board so you'll see when you have uh, 
quarries and everything, you all the monsters and everything, they always come with one of these basic cards. As you can see here, then they're divided by levels. Level 1, 2, level 3. And for this one, it's a custom deck, everything, because this is the prologue. So basically, monster cards, or monsters are divided up, their AI decks are what determines how they play. So you'll see there be basic, advanced, and legendary cards within the AI decks. They also have special uh, special cards, which are usually just like traits or add, added rules. So then this is how you set up their deck. So the decks for monsters also act as their life totals. So, for example, this would be 7 basic, 3 a, uh, advanced. That'd be a deck of 10, plus 1 extra for the basic action, which is always located on the back of the uh, the setup card here, the little, you know, the AI card. So, what that means is for the quarry, you have to go completely through its AI deck here. So, you'd have to go through all these cards. Whenever you deal a damage to it, you always, you discard one card. So, you deal a damage, discard a card, it becomes part of the wound stack. And as you play through it, yeah, uh, you that's its life total. So monster's life total in this case for the prologue is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine life total with a custom card on the top here, which is always going to be claw for the prologue. And for the hit location, it's always going to be strange hand, which we have set up. So that's how you determine how strong monsters are. That's how you set up monsters, that's how you build the AI decks. You'll also be uh, there's also a showdown page in the rule book which tells you how to do terrain setup and all those things, but that's not for this prologue. So, in Kingdom Death, monsters always go first. So, to determine what the monster will do, you draw the top AI card, and that will determine how it reacts on its turn. So, it always goes monster turn, then uh, the survivor's turn, and then you as a player can decide, you know, the turn order for the survivors, but all four survivors or, you know, the numbers that are still alive, they'll all go on the same route. So, so here we go for Claw. We're going to be, it's a basic AI card. It's going to pick target, which is the closest threat facing in range. So we'll go through this first off. So for closest threat, uh, you're a threat through a number of, number of things, as long as, you know, if you're standing, there, there's lots of things that make you a threat, but you're, you're pretty much always a threat unless you're standing in the blind spot, which is just these two things here, or, or no, you're still threatened, you're just not in field of view. So, yeah, unless you're knocked down, you're considered a threat, but there's all kinds of things that make you not a threat, so. For this case, everyone's a threat. Then it will be the closest, so you look at the AI card of the monster. So for here, the prologue has a movement of 6, a toughness of 6. So closest threat, meaning now you count spaces. Because of the setup, everyone is going to be within 6 spaces of the white lion. So everyone is the closest threat. So as you'll see here, it goes closest threat. So we just calculated it out, everyone's within 6 spaces and everyone is a threat. Then it's going to be in facing. Now, as you'll see here, facing is the way that the monster is looking. So the white line is looking this direction. And facing is everything. So there's, as you see, there's a line here because it's a gridded combat system. Facing is everything that it's looking at. So as you can see, you know, these three survivors conveniently are not in its facing. So, now that it has a single target, because, again, we went through closest threat, which was everyone, however, facing was only one person, and then next would be in range, and, again, they're all in range because he has movement six, and everyone starts off six away. So, that's how we do, that's how we decided pick target. Now let's go ahead and move the white line. So you count one, two, three, four, five, and you stop right there. Now let's look at the next one. Now that we've picked target, this is what's called a break. So there's survival ability, or this, this, it's just a break. There, there's all kinds of stuff you can do during breaks, but that's what this mark is. Then uh, it's going to move, which I just did, and then attack the target. 
So it's going to be a speed two. Speed represents the number of D10s you will roll. It's got an accuracy of two plus, meaning when you now roll your two D10s, you need an, any of those, which is a two plus, will be considered a hit. And then each hit will do the indicated amount of damage, which is one. So now we will go ahead and we will roll our two dice. So of course, two hits, that's a nine and a six. So each one of those will be doing one damage. So now I'll take the AI card, I'll just discard it here. Now we will roll hit location dice, which are these dice that have a whole bunch of hit locations on them. As you can see, you have body twice and everything else once. So it is a D6 with all five except for body being on there twice. Now I'll roll the hit location dice. Sorry, my neighbor has a motorcycle and he is out on it. So if that you hear that in the background, that's what it is. Okay, we're now rolling. So you can see here that I rolled the head and the waist, which is just absolutely perfect in this uh, situation because that will do two damage to lightning here however she is wearing the dormant twilight cloak so the dormant twilight cloak has three armor points so she'll that will bring it down to two and they all of them have the cloth and their waist which provides one armor point taking the one damage will remove the armor point bringing it down to zero so that was actually really perfect went exactly according to plan that is very rare in kingdom death normally <laughs> you can set up the ai deck how you want it to play or how you want it to happen but normally how things resolve do not play out according to plan all right so that will end the monster's turn next will be the survivor's turn so we have lightning here who's the twilight knight then we have we're going to have Bill is another survivor who is next to Yisa here. And then we have Mordor. So we will go with Yisa first as she's the farthest away. Um, because as I set up, like I said, I knew he was going to attack lightning because I know Claw, but all those things. So she's the farthest away. So survivors have movement of five as the you know the starting things can change that injuries all things can happen to change that but movement of five is the normal amount so we will go ahead one two three four five i'll move her to here now she has no ranged weapons as is however i'm going to have her throw her founding stone so she will go ahead and do that the Founding Stone is this weapon right here. So, how weapons work is this. You need to spend an action to do it. Then it will have two speed. Just like with the monster, you will roll two dice. This is the accuracy of the weapon. Seven plus, just like the monster did. I would need, of those two dice, only seven pluses would register as hits. And then this is the strength of the weapon. Strength is something monsters do not have. They have toughness instead. So when you calculate out the toughness... Well, I'll explain that when someone else attacks. But for this specific thing, we will be doing the activation here where you can spend your action to sling the stone from anywhere on the board. Activate this card for one addition... Or, um, archive this card for one automatic hit inflicting a critical wound. So she will be archiving this. We will draw a hit location because whenever you hit draw a hit, you draw hit location cards equal to the number of registered hits. So archiving that guaranteed us one hit. We will draw the strange hand. As you can see, there's what would normally happen. However, we're going to store a critical hit. So this automatically scored a critical. So criticals cancel the reactions on this card. You hack off the monster's hand. Spend one survival to treasure this moment and gain plus one permanent strength. Okay, and this is also a persistent injury, lost hands. So with persistent injury, we place it in play. That is one damage for a critical hit. 
discard the top card of the AI to represent him losing one life or taking one damage, however you want to say it. Um, she will spend her one survival. How you gain survival is at the current moment, the settlement has, you start with one survival as your survival limit, and you gain a survival for naming your survivor. When you name them, they gain one survival. So everyone has one survival to spend, except for Yisa, who just spent her one survival, to treasure that moment and to gain a permanent plus one strength. All right. That is the end of her turn. Now we'll just go ahead and move one, two, three, four, five to here with Bill. One, two, three, four, five. And one, two, three, four, five to there with Mordor. Now we have Lightning, who doesn't even need to move. She's perfectly fine right where she is. So, Lightning with the Twilight Sword. Twilight Sword is a unique weapon. Uh, in more ways than one. <laughs> it's also unique. <laughs> but, uh, so, Twilight Sword, for your activation, normally you would have to not move. So normally you would do no movement, and then you'd spend your movement and your activation because it's a cumbersome weapon. However, she ignores cumbersome because of the dormant Twilight Cloak. So, she could move if she wants to, however, she's not going to. So, it has one speed here. It also has one speed because of the keyword slow, which makes any weapon uh, one speed. So it will have one speed, and you can see the asterisk here. So the strength of this weapon is right here. The accuracy is the Twilight Sword's proficiency level. Or my, 9 minus Twilight Sword's proficiency level. So she starts with 3, which is... Oh, it's actually the... It's not the Dormant Cloak that's making her ignore Cumbersome, it's the specialization for the Twilight Sword that's making her do that. The Dormant Cloak is uh, just making it so she ignores Sentient, but anyway. So she's ignoring Cumbersome. Uh, as you can see, it's Cumbersome and Sentient, but she's ignoring Sentient because of the Cloak, whatever. So it's going to be 9 minus th that three that she starts with, making it an accuracy of six. So it's going to be one speed, six plus, so she misses. And that is the end of her turn. Now it will go back to the monster's turn. Start monster's turn by drawing the top. Ooh. So we got Maul here. So, it's Victim of Grab last round is the start. However, there was no Victims of Grab last round. So, that is not the person who will be being bald. It's the closest knockdown survivor in range. No knockdown survivors. So, that is also ignored. No target, which is where we are now. Sniff. So, this is the instinct. Most monsters have instinct. So we will be performing Sniff. Instincts are located on the showdown page as well as on usually located here on the card. So the white lion sniffs the air and ends its turn. Until the end of the next round, all survivors are now threats despite any effects that say otherwise. Okay. So that's the end of Monster's turn. Now we come back to the survivor's turn. So, Survivor's turn now is a little bit more exciting. <laughs> We've got one, two, three, four to get to here. Now, as you notice, I am going to be the space right behind, directly <laughs> behind the monster. So that is the blind spot. When you are in a monster's blind spot, you gain plus one accuracy. So... We will be attacking with Fist and Tooth. Fist and Tooth is located on the gear card. Uh, everyone always leaves with Fist, with fist and Tooth. It is a weapon that you always have. Yeah, Swiver may always use. We always fight with their Fist and Tooth. Here it is a Speed 2, Accuracy 8+, plus with a Strength 0. However, it is deadly, meaning you have plus 1 luck. So we'll go over all those things. So... 
We'll be attacking with fist and tooth. Because we're in the blind spot, we'll be getting plus one accuracy. So that would be two speed, a seven plus. Uh, that's a double miss, so we don't have to worry about it. Next, we will go with Bill. One, two, three, four here. He will also be doing the same thing. Fist and tooth, two speed, accuracy, seven plus. We'll just go ahead and also miss again twice. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. We'll get Yisa to here. She'll go ahead and attack with Fist and Tooth. Now she has to attack with Fist and Tooth because she threw her Founding Stone, so she no longer has that as a weapon option. However, Founding Stone is the same exact thing when you're in the blind spot. It's Founding Stone has a seven accuracy. Could have lowered it down to a six plus accuracy with the Founding Stone, but we'll attack with Fist and Tooth because of the deadly. When we wound, I'll actually talk about deadly. <laughs> So, Fist and Tooth here with Yisa as well, who is now getting 2 speed 8 plus because she is not in the monster's blind spot. Uh, that's at least one hit, so I can at least talk about a hit now. <laughs> so you draw the first card, or of the, you draw a number of cards equal to the number of hits you've done. So, we've hit the Beast's Heel. You clip the muscles of the heel. So, there's nothing here. There normally be some sort of reaction or something, however, we just get flavor text. So, now we roll. The White Lion has a toughness of six. As you can see here, toughness of six. That determines what it is we need to roll in order to score a hit. So, we take our strength, and sub our, we take the monster's toughness and subtract the strength. So, Yisa, because she threw the Founding Stone, she gained plus one permanent strength. So, she has plus one strength. Means she needs... In order to wound, she needs a 5 plus to hit. Now, a critical is on a 10 plus. So, in this game, a natural 1 is always a miss, regardless. So, even if you had 100 strength, you'd still blow wounding on a 1. It's always a failure. Same thing if you had 100 accuracy. Likewise, with the crit, 10 is always going to crit. So, if there's a crit available. I'll say there has to be a critical available. If there's no critical on the card, you can't crit. But deadly adds plus one luck. Luck determines the number that you need to score a crit. So a 10 is what everybody needs. With plus one luck, because of the fist and tooth, you gain plus one luck. It means she crits on a 9 or a 10. So in D&D, &D, that would be increased threat range for critical. So that's what luck does. So she is going to wound on a... 5 plus and crit on a 9 or a 10. Uh, okay, there we go. So she crit. So, uh, your precise attack ruins the monster's st whoops, straining tendon. The white lion is knocked down. This is a persistent injury. Ruptured tendon. When the white lion starts its movement, roll 1d10. On a result of 1, the white lion is knocked down. Okay, so the white lion is now knocked down, and that results in a wound. This is a permanent injury, so we'll set the permanent injury aside. Take the top card of the AI deck, put it into the wound stack. We've now done two wounds. Now the monster is knocked down. So, I take tokens and I place them on the monster when they're knocked down. I do the same for survivors, just indication of it being knocked down. Now, when something is knocked down, survivor or monster, you hit it on a 3+. plus. So now, we will go with Lightning, who has her Twilight Sword. Again, it is slow, so it has a 1 speed. However, now, what was once she hit on a 6+, plus accuracy, because it was... 9 minus her Twilight Sword proficiency, being 6, or being 3, resulting in a 6, we now hit on a 3+. plus. Uh, okay, so she scores 1 hit. Again, draw the top card of the hit location deck. Draw a number of cards equal to the number of hits you have. So, this one has a reaction. When a monster is knocked down, all reactions are ignored when not when a monster is knocked down so there will be no reactions however what a reaction is here is it's labeled with an r here and as you see on a failure there are multiple different types of reactions for this specific instance a reaction on a failure means if you fail to wound 
the reaction will trigger. If you successfully wound, that's not a failure, so there would be no reaction. So, here we go. We need... Now the Twilight Sword has a 9 strength. So, as I was saying, we can only miss on a 1 here because it has a 6 toughness. So as long as we don't roll a 1, we will wound. That is a wound. She only crits on a 10 because Twilight Sword is not deadly. So, that is a wound. We will go ahead and remove the top card of the AI card, or the AI deck. Place it in the wound stack to represent taking another hit. And then you discard the wound, or the hit location cards into the wound ones. <laughs> the wound stack, or the hit location discard pile. We hadn't done that yet because all these have been persistent injuries. So, start of the monster's turn. Monster will now stand. Monsters uh, stand at a variety of different points when they are knocked down. There are also traits in the game which alter when monsters will stand. But for the basic rules of the game, the monster will stand at the start of its turn or when a trap is pulled. Um, there's, a, there's some other things, but... Those are the only things that could happen in the prologue. <laughs> so, it stands at the start of the turn. Now it draws a AI card. Draw the top one, which is Grasp. Um, it does not need to move yet. Persistent Injury. We're looking for Lost Hand, which should not come up. And it doesn't need to move yet for the Ruption Tender. Okay. So, Grasp. Pick target. Closest knocked down survivor in range. There is not a knockdown survivor, so we'll ignore that. Closest survivor in range. That is everyone. So, we will go ahead and um, have it target Lightning here. She's the closest. It is. No there are moments in which it would indicate that it's a random survivor or something like that. And if you're not playing solo... If you're playing with other people, you have the monster controller, and the monster controller would get to pick who gets targeted. However, if you're playing solo, you do not use the monster controller rules. Unless it pertains to after beating the Watcher, then the monster controller, you know, they come back. <laughs> for some reason. Uh, so, as I said, it's not random. We're just going to go ahead and pick her. We're not going to gain the insanity from having the monster controller tile, because you do not gain that. Um, oops, I didn't do it yet. So, there's no need for him to move. I was going to roll for the ruptured tendon, but he's not going to move. So, he's just going to go ahead and attack, which is a speed one. So, on a two plus, which, okay, he hits. It's going to be damage one. Now, this has an after damage trigger. Let's see if damage will be done. So, now, uh, it will be to the body. And we do not want that after damage trigger to happen. So, at the start of the game, everyone has survival actions they may spend. There are a lot of survival actions, more maybe to be added, who knows. Uh, but for right now, everyone starts with dodge. So, you can spend a survival to dodge one hit. So, she will go ahead and spend that. She has now no survival. And she will go ahead and dodge that. Now, since she dodged it, there is no after damage to trigger. Because no damage was dealt after damage. And that's the end of that. Back to the survivor's turn. Who... well. Alright, we'll go ahead and attack with uh, Mordor first. So Mordor here. He'll go ahead and attack. He's got his fist and tooth. Which is two speed. He's in the blind spot, so he'll go ahead and hit with a seven accuracy. Uh, that's one hit, just the eight. So he will go ahead. We'll draw the top hit location card, which is the beast's maw here. So this has a reaction for a failure, so hopefully we wound. All right, here we go, rolling. Now we only had one hit, so we roll one dice. He has no strength. Fist and Tooth has no strength, so it would just be a 6 plus, critting on a 9 or a 10. That's an 8, so we do wound. So the failure does not happen because we did wound, we did not crit. So nothing on this card plays out. We go ahead, take the top card of the AI deck, put it in the wound stack. 
Now, he can go ahead and move. He will do his one, two, three, four. He will go to move to there. Even though he has a movement of five, I'm only gonna move four. Next, we will do with Bill here, who's going to have fist and tooth again, two speed, missing both times. And he will do the same, one, two, three, four, just to get here. Now, uh, yeah, sure, I guess we'll move Isa into the blind spot. She will go ahead and do fist and tooth, two speed. Now she will be hitting on his seven plus. Uh, she'll go ahead and miss as well. Great. Now, as you saw, I only moved twice here to get here, but when you move, you have to move all your, you can move up to your movement. You can't move to attack, then finish out your movement. You can't do that. So that is the end of all their turns. Now we go with lightning. She will have a one speed because of Twilight Sword being slow. Accuracy six plus. That is a miss. This is going very well. Now, monster turn. We'll draw the top AI card here. This is a mood card, indicated here by this blue banner. When this comes into play, you draw another AI card. While Enrage is in play, White Lion gains plus one damage token per monster level. So it's just going to gain plus one damage because this is a level one monster. Okay. And then when a survivor and when a survivor suffers any dismembered severe injury or is killed, discard enraged. Okay, so enraged here goes over on the moods here. Um, now we will now shuffle. So there's three cards left. You'll go ahead and shuffle these. Now we will draw another card. Maul. Great. I'm happy about that. Okay. Victim of grab last round. No one was a victim. Closest knocked down. Survivor in ranged. No one is knocked down. Target sniff. Okay. Sniff. Again. Oops. <laughs> I flipped that over to say what sniff was, but it's not there. So, sniff. Again. The white lion sniffs the air and ends its turn. Then, until the end of the next turn, all survivors are all threats, despite anything that would say otherwise. Okay, so that's it. He has... Um, so, it's actually trying to explain the mood. So when moods are in play, they are not part of the AI deck. So, he had four cards in his AI deck, plus basic action. So you would think he would still have five life. However, the mood has been taken out of the basic or out of the AI deck, so now he has four cards left in basic action. So he only had five hits, so he's effectively made himself weaker, or he's only got four hits now because he's he's out of three cards and just a basic attack. So made himself weaker. So if we can kill him now with four hits, that would be great. Four damage would kill him. Let's start with uh, Mordor. We'll go... Well, we'll start with Yisa, actually. She's still in the blind spot, then we'll move her out of the blind spot. So, Fist and Tooth, two speed, accuracy six pl uh, seven plus. That's one hit. We will draw the top card of the hit location deck. We have the Beast's Chest here, so it's reaction on a failure. So it's a good thing we actually did Yisa first, because I... There's always a chance he could move around. But we're going to be critting on, or critting on a 9 or a 10, wounding on a 5. Because remember, Yisa has plus 1 strength, toughness of 6 for the Prologue White Lion, minus the 1 strength. So wounding on a 5, 50, or uh, wounding on a 5, 9 or a 10 to crit. That is another crit for her. That's amazing. So that cancels the reaction here. Uh, the reaction wouldn't have happened anyway because she was successful, but it's just always good to note that crits are going to cancel the reaction. So, you strike the lion's stout heart. Gain one random white lion resource. Roll 1d10. If the result is a 10, the white lion instantly die, or dies instantly. Uh, it's a 9. <laughs> Luck does not affect that, but uh, she almost ripped out the thing's throat. <laughs> From behind it. It's quite the feat. So, she did one damage. I'll discard the one AI card. She has done all the damage. She's... This is crazy. I think she's also crit every time. <laughs> uh, okay. 
uh, what was I doing? Oh, random white lion resource. So, white lion resource here. You can see huge deck. Shuffle it up. We're going to gain a random one. And yeah. Oh my. Okay. I shuffled that. <laughs> uh, okay. I shuffled it. I swear to two camera angles of it. I can show two camera angles of it. Oh, this happened with the last prologue, too. Well, not that exact thing, but okay, so I've cat. We got that. <laughs> oh, I don't. I didn't want it to happen last time. Oh, I don't like that that keeps happening. It looks so rigged, but it's not rigged. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm all on tilt now. Okay, whatever. So that happened. Um, uh, she can move away. One, two, three. We'll just get her to four over there. Um, we'll go with Mordor now. One, two, three, four. Get him into the blind spot. Uh, we're going to speed. Accuracy seven plus. Uh, he got one hit at least. Draw the top of the hit deck. Glorious main. This is a good one. I mean, it's it's a bad one, but it's a good one <laughs> to explain things as long as you're learning how to play. So this is impervious. Impervious hit locations cannot be wounded. A wound or a critical wound will not remove an AI card. However, they still have effects sometimes. So this has no chance of doing damage, but it also has no chance of us resulting in attack. So basically, we're just looking for a 9 or a 10. Come on, Mordor, don't let me down. Okay. No big deal. So nothing happens. We were trying to crit, we couldn't. That's the end of that. Next, we've got Bill. One, two, three, four. We'll go here. Into the blind spot. Two dice, seven plus. Uh, that's one. Top of the hit deck. The Beast's Ear. So this is going to be a reaction on a failure. So, again, well not again, Yisa was wounding on a 5, so Bill needs a 6 to wound, or a 9 or a 10 to crit. That is the opposite of a crit. That is a failure. That is a critical failure. So the White Lion jumps back. Without turning, move the monster one space directly away from the attacker. Cancel all unresolved hits now out of range. So there's no more hits to go through, but had we had more hit, I would say had he hit twice, and for some reason I decided to choose this, because you get to choose which hit location you wound first. Had I wounded twice, it would have canceled now the other ones. Perhaps. Maybe. We're going to look, so what it's going to do here, without turning, you're going to move the monster one space. So we have this persistent injury, which is the beast's heal here. So, Persistent Injury, you keep it in play. Uh, when the White Lion... Oh, starts its movement. Which it's doing now. It's Roll 1d10. So, it's going to be knocked down if I roll another 1. Uh, I didn't. But, had, it would have been nice. Some person can dream. Uh, so, that stays in play. This is the Beast Ear is the one that's... Would have been nice. Okay, so it moves one back going to result in collision and since it's only moving one it's going to result in collision and him stopping on it so when the when you so first collision is had the, let's say the white lion wanted to move you know five spaces and would have ran through the person that would have just resulted in them being knocked down but now since they're going to be they're going to be stopped on when you get moved you suffer uh what is it? I can't remember the name of the other turn. It's not knocked down. It's bash. You suffer bash <laughs> from coll no. You suffer collision, which isn't bash. Res collision results in bash. So either way, going to result in knockdown. And then, since 
he's stomping on them. Uh, they're now going to get suffer knockback, and the knockback will be knockback five. So they're going to get collision, which is going to result in knockdown. Now knockback five, which is one. Um, we can go this way. One, two, three. Four. Well, I guess one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And then they are both knocked down. Now, um, put the two tokens on them. There they are. They're both knocked down, and he moved back his one space. That's it. Now we go with lightning. Who might as well? Can she get to the blind spot? One, two, three, four. No, she can't because of these two clowning around back there and making him jump back. So he can't. Okay, so speed one, uh, six plus. That is a hit for lightning. The beast's flank. So this is going to be on a wound. So she nine. the twilight sword has nine strength. So it's going to be a ten to crit or a one to not do anything. So that's a wound. So we're going to cause a wound, but first we're going to resolve this re wound reaction. Uh, cats hate this. The monster is very upset. Attacker gains the priority target token. Okay. So, first we'll resolve the rest of this. So you discard the hit location, put it top of the discard. Then, since she did score a hit, we discard one AI card. That will leave us with just Maul here. So I'm just going to, you know, now I'm, he's going to draw Maul. Maul's just going to continue happening all the time. <laughs> Until I wound him. But that's okay. So, next, we now give priority target token to Lightning. Which, again, is fine unless some craziness happens resulting in instant death which would be bad so when the monster performs a target pick target they'll always choose you that's what the priority target you're just always going to be picked and then when you are picked as after you're picked as a target you resolve it and then you discard the priority target token so now it is the monster's turn uh, again it's going to do maul so this is going to be the victim of grab. However, with the priority target, it's always going to target lightning. So lightning's the target now from Maul. So it's going to be a two speed accuracy two plus. Here we go. Two speed accuracy two plus. That's two hits. Uh, it's going to be four damage. <laughs> this could be a very short campaign. Because if she dies, it's the end of the campaign. Uh, so it's going to be four damage. Because of the mood that's... Because of the enraged mood. Uh, but enraged might get discarded right away. So. Here we go. Uh, yeah, that's going to be four damage. That's really bad. Let's see where it goes. Hopefully the head? Uh, actually, no. The head's also bad. Everything's bad. Four damage is really bad here. Uh, this is discarded now. Four damage is really bad. Uh, body... Okay, that's two severe injuries. So, that's two severe injuries to the body and to the hands. So, with a severe injury, you go to the book and you look at the severe injuries. I have a cheat sheet. I would highly recommend printing out a cheat sheet for these because severe injuries happen a lot. <laughs> or you can memorize the table. If you memorize the table, good for you. Uh, okay, here we go. So, severe injury. Uh, hands first. Severe injury arms, actually. That's a seven. Broken arm. <laughs> uh, an ear-shattering crunch. Suffer minus one permanent accuracy and minus one permanent strength. Gain a bleeding token. This is, uh, this is really bad. Lightning's got minus one accuracy, minus one strength now. It's really, really bad. It's really bad. That's Okay, so that's the hands. Now we go to the body. Uh, ten. That's bowled over. The blow sends you sprawling and you are knocked down. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let me see. Was that a dis I had to check to make sure that wasn't a dismembered. 
No, it's a broken arm. Yeah, so that's not going to discard Enraged. Because no one suffered a dismembered injury and no one died. So she didn't lose the arm, just broken. <laughs> Alright, that's the end of that. Uh, two bleeds... Oh, no, where's the after... I had to look at the after damage on this. So she's knocked down from the severe injury, but target gains one bleed token. So she's actually going to gain two bleed tokens. One from the severe injury, then one from this after damage. So she's at two bleed tokens now. Uh, bleed tokens, you die when you have five of them. So, great. She's got herself a severe arm and a severe body. <laughs> or a heavy body, heavy arms. Good. It's perfect. And she's knocked down. So... It looks like Yisa... I mean, she was the only one doing anything anyway. So, now, for Knockdown Survivors, you stand at the start of the next uh, monster turn. Now it's the... St so that's the end of the monster's turn. So, for these two, who were knocked down during the last uh, survivor's turn, so it goes monster's turn, survivor's turn, then it rolls over to Monster's turn, and then that ends. You you stand at the end of the next Monster's turn. So they were knocked down on their Survivor's turn, then it rolled over to the Monster's turn. They stayed knocked down the whole time. Now the Monster's turn ends. Now they stand. However, with Lightning, she was knocked down during the Monster's turn, so she doesn't stand till the end of the next Monster turn. Sorry if you can hear the motorcycle. So, I know he's but I'm just going to go. Hopefully, it's not too bad. All right. So, she's still knocked down, uh, which is really bad because Maul's always going to target her. Uh, and she cannot die. <laughs> the campaign's over if she dies. So, luckily, he's only got two hits left. So, one, two with Yisa here. Oh, whoops. I meant to go here. One, one, two to go into the blind spot. So, she's got two speed. Uh... Seven or uh, seven plus accuracy. Uh, so she missed twice. So now one, two, three, four here with Mordor. Uh, yeah, he also missed twice. One, so one, two, three, four, five, five here with Bill. Uh, okay. There's nothing I can do <laughs> now. Uh, Maul's going to target Lightning here. Uh, yep. Yep. So that's going to suck. Okay, Maul's going to target Lightning again. It's going to do four damage, so this is going to be really bad. Okay, uh, <laughs> she's going to gain probably two bleed. Possibly three bleed. This could be really bad. Okay, here we go. Maul. It's going to be... Again. Uh, victim of grab last round. She wasn't grabbed. However, it's closest knockdown survivor in range, which is lightning. So, that's why she's getting targeted. I'll leave this here. Two speed. Accuracy. Two plus... That's two hits for four damage apiece. <laughs> Here we go. Two hits, four damage apiece. Uh, yeah. Waste, that's a severe. So we'll roll the severe and the waste here. So waste, severe. Here we go. Uh, eight. Slashed back. Making sudden movements, it's excruciatingly painful. You cannot surge until the showdown ends. You can't surge anyway. So gain a bleeding token. Okay, so that's one bleed. Uh, that's two bleeds now because the after damage triggered. So we're at four bleeds. Uh, one more bleed will be the end of this season. 
Uh, <laughs> this is quite crazy. Okay, now uh, the next... Whoa, I didn't roll the dice yet. Uh, body. So body, again, that's already a severe. Okay, so body... Another 10. I think that's over. Uh, body. The blow sends you sprawling. You were knocked down. She's knocked down again. Oh, but I don't get a bleed. <laughs> uh, well, she doesn't actually go anywhere. Okay. Uh, yeah, so she's knocked down again. Oh no, she doesn't actually move anywhere. Okay, well, no, she's not going to stand. My bad. Um, alright. Well. Hmm. Looks like I just had to throw two founding stones. There's nothing I can do. Yeah, I'm just going to have to throw two founding stones. Wow, that sucks. I wasted all three founding stones. I mean, I have to assume I don't draw the trap here, either. It's pretty much if I draw the trap, it's gonna be over. <sighs> well, wait, I could wound him and get him to basic action. Let me see if I can wound him without throwing the founding stone. Um, and then if I can wound him, and then he's down to basic action, at least basic action won't target lightning, and then I can at least not worry about drawing the trap with her in front of him. I can move him someplace else. Because if I draw the trap and she gets hit by anything, she'll die because of the, the bleed. I can't have a bleed. Uh, where's basic action? So ba here's basic action. Closest survivor in field of view. So I need, really need to get him to basic action. Okay, so let's go with Yisa first. Uh, that's one hit with the nine. Okay, so it's not the trap. Okay. Uh, so this is going to do something on a wound. Okay, so she wounds on a five plus and crits on a nine. Okay, so that's a wound. So she did, she got rid of Maul here. So he's down to basic action. Now let's do the reaction on the wound here. Snarling the monster swats at its target. Attack suffers one brain damage. Perform basic action. Target the attacker. Okay. So we're going to do basic action. Okay. So basic action here. Closest survivor. Well, it's always going to target her. So it's going to turn around. There we go, and it's going to be two speed, two accuracy, two damage. So that's two hits. It's going to be two damage apiece. Uh, hand and body, so that's going to be two heavy injuries. So the heavy injuries are going to result in her being knocked down from just being a heavy injury. You get knocked down. So she's now knocked down. And Yisa has a heavy body and a heavy arm, was it? Yeah. Okay, so I keep rolling bodies and arms. <laughs> uh, wait, I rolled waste with lightning. So heavy waste for lightning. She's got three. Okay. So... Uh, yep, this is going to be insane here, but this is what I'm just going to have to do. So now he's going to get basic action. So basic action is going to be the closest survivor in field of view. So, if I just move... Oh, she's knocked down. i got to put a knockdown token. So, one, two, three, four, five. 
five for Bill. One, two, three, four, five for uh, Mordor. And that's going to make Closest Survivor here. Or no, I'm going to make it. Closest Survivor is still going to be Mordor. <laughs> yep, he's just going to take this one. So, here we go. We're going to perform basic action. Because I'm going to be done. I'm, a pa I'm passing with those two. Okay, closest survivor in field of view, which is going to be two speed, two plus accuracy, so it's attacking Mordor. Two speed, two plus accuracy, two damage. That's going to hit Mordor twice. <laughs> and it's going to do body and feet for heavy injuries. So he's knocked down. And he's got himself body and feet, heavy injury. Okay, Mordor, where are you at? Body, feet, or legs, whatever. Two heavy injuries, knocked down. All right. That's the end of the monster's turn. So he's got one hit left. Lightning now stands. Yisa stands. So now it's Lightning's turn. Lightning's going to go ahead and attack with her Twilight Sword. <laughs> so it's going to be one speed. Um, yeah, it's one speed. Accuracy was a six, but now she's got minus one permanent accuracy. So it's accuracy seven, but she's in the blind spot. So it's back down to accuracy six. Okay, that's a 10. But that doesn't really matter. So as long as this isn't the trap, we're good. Fleshy gut. As long as she doesn't fail, we're good. Uh, she's got strength. The thing's got strength nine. It's got she's got minus one permanent strength, so it's an eight, but still stronger than his six toughness. So as long as this isn't a one, that's another crit. Wow. Uh, okay. Cancel the reaction. The white lion vomits all over you. It flees. Gain one random basic resource and gain three insanity. So she gains... Th oh, you know what? I forgot to take... Uh, oh, no. She would have had a light injury on the insanity. I forgot to take the one brain damage for Yisa, but that would have just given her light damage. Okay. So I gain a basic resource and three insanity, and that kills it. That was the last one for the basic action. Okay. Uh, three insanity... It's quite crazy. <laughs> and a basic resource. Okay, that was that was the stupid risky thing. I should have just thrown the founding stones to not let uh, her die. But there's a method to my madness. Okay, now uh, with the that's the end of the white lion. We have killed the White Lion. I just want to make sure now how many uh, resources we draw when you kill the White Lion. I think it's different for the Survivor, or for the Prologue, but I just want to double check here real quick. So... Uh, finish the showdown. Okay, if the White Lion is killed, the remaining Survivors are victorious. The aftermath, players should sow. Collect your rewards. Scavenging the monster's corpse. Survivors earn resources. This is in addition to any resources earned from critical wounds during the showdown. So those are in addition to those ones. Draw four basic and four white lion. Alright, and everybody gains a hunt XP. And lightning gains a twilight uh, sword proficiency because I had to wound with her. <laughs> I had to get that wound. So she's at four proficiency now because she had she already had selected the proficiency. Okay, so everyone else gains one hunt experience or I mean everyone gains one hunt experience not everyone else. So everyone's at one hunt XP. Lightning gains it. Bill gains it. Yisa gains. Mordor gains. Now we draw four 
White Lion Resources. White Fur, White Fur, Great Cat Bone, it's Sinew. Four Basic Resources. Uh huh. Monster Bone, Monster Hide, Monster Hide, Monster Hide. That was the. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, so that's all the stuff we get from killing the white lion. Now, um, we survive. We would do the settlement phase, but I'll do that in the next episode, and I'll explain all those other things. However, I want to do... Where is it? Uh, we triggered a strain, which is what I was going for. I was going to show this in the settlement phase, but... Because it was the riskiest play ever, I want to make sure I show it now so people aren't like, what, what were you doing? Why didn't you just throw the Twilight? Why did you pass with those survivors? So, uh, Sweat Stained Oath, Milestone Condition. This, would, this won't be triggered until the settlement event, but I just want to show it now. A survivor gains a sword during the hunt or showdown, which Lightning did. She gained the Twilight Sword because you start the, you start the uh, People of the Lantern campaign just like normal, and you add the Twilight Sword to her. You give it to her when you nominate when you nominate one during the show the setup. So she gained the Twilight Sword uh, during the showdown, and uses it to deliver the killing blow that Lantern year, which she just did. She killed the White Lion, so the milestone condition has been met. Permanent effect. Lightning splits the sky. I'm assuming the act, not her. However, I didn't even read this permanent effect. That's pretty pretty ridiculous that it is also that. Illuminating a blade-shaped castle that was not there before. Gouts of water spray from the castle. Mingling with the survivor's sweat, the rain hisses. In the sibilant sound, the survivor hears a challenge. Permanently add Sword Oath to your Fighting Art deck. The survivor gains Sword Oath. Add the settlement event Acid Rain to the next Lantern Year in the timeline. So that won't be this. That won't be this coming up one. It will be the next one. Um, just because I wanted to show why I did that ridiculous play that risked the entire campaign, which came down to a die roll of me dying. <laughs> so I wanted to explain why I tried to kill the stupid thing. So, Sword Oath. Uh, where is Sword Oath? I gotta grab it. Because it's not. It's one of the strained cards. Uh, here it is. So, Lightning gains the Sword Oath. Uh, fighting Arts. When you gain this, write the name of any sword gear on your record sheet. Uh, note each time you wound with the named sword. If you have wounded 18 plus times with the sword, it gains devastating one and sentient while you have it equipped. When you suffer the flea brain, tra uh, brain trauma, lose this fighting art. All right. So she gains sword oath, and I'll have to write down the name of this twilight sword. So that is the end of the prologue. I will do the first settlement phase next episode thank you so much for watching it's so very humbling i'm so happy to be back it's going to be awesome fun times i'm looking forward to it and hopefully we never come down to a die roll ending a campaign but i'm sure we will that was insanely close i can't believe this is almost the second time of three attempts that i've recorded that i've almost lost to the prologue <laughs> That's crazy. If you want to see me lose to the prologue, there's a video. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Season 2 is now underway. Should be a lot of fun. I look forward to playing with everyone again, just like Season 2, or Season 1. It was so fun. I'm so excited. Thank you so much.